And here, here's what happens is that Jesus starts telling this story, and I love it because parable simply means to throw alongside. So it's a story thrown alongside a truth. Jesus was a parabolic teacher. And sometimes he would teach in parables to reveal truth, and sometimes the scriptures tell us it was to conceal truth. Because there's some people that followed his ministry that just wanted his food, but they didn't want his truth. And so Jesus starts, he starts like throwing this parable out there to this guy, and he's trying to reveal to this guy, not just the truth, but to reveal to this guy the condition of his heart, which really there, which is racial hate and racial pride. And he begins to tell this story, and he says, you know, there's a guy that's coming down a road, and he would have known this road from Jericho to, to, to Jerusalem. It's called the Bloody Pass. I've been down over in this area. And people would not travel this road by themselves. Usually they were in a caravan. And he says that this guy is coming down the road, and we don't know what race this guy is, but the implications, most scholars believe the implications is that Jesus is depicting that it's a Jewish man that's traveling on this road. He's going down this road. Robbers come out. They beat him up. They strip him naked. They take all of his possessions. They leave him to die in this ditch, in a desperate situation, dying, hopeless, no one to help him. If someone doesn't help him, he will die. He will die. This is the picture Jesus is painting. And this religious expert is leaning into every word that Jesus has. And Jesus says, okay, so here's how it goes. A priest, let's put it in our turn, a pastor shows up and he's walking down this road and he sees this desperate person in this situation on the other side. And it says that the, he says that the pastor, he goes on the exact opposite side of this man in his brokenness and he passes by. I mean, this is a moment where the expert, when he heard that a priest is coming, he probably would have thought like, Oh, here comes a hero to save the day. Here's the savior in the story. And to his amazement, the guy passes by. I don't, we don't know. Was he on his way to church? How many know it's easier to go to church than actually be the church? We don't know what he was going to do, but he had some excuse that was more important than this man. Second guy, Jesus says, shows up as a Levite. This is like the A-team, right? This is like, we call ours the dream team. This is the volunteer at the church, the guy that the lady that serves at the church. So, so, the, so the expert of the law would have been like, well, if the, the pastor probably had some very you know, spiritual, sacred responsibilities, and now this other guy, he's, he's got in his job description, he's, he's probably gonna take care of this because he's a spiritual person. These are two church people that Jesus is describing. <clears throat> and and he, he says, that, but the Levite, Levite as well, he, he goes to the other side, creates distance between the man's brokenness, separates himself from the man's bro, and he just goes on his way. And the expert's probably just thinking like, that's strange. And then Jesus, he, this is the most provocative parable. Jesus says, says, now a Samaritan shows up. And the expert leans in and goes, oh, someone needs to call the cops because this is the villain of the story. It was the Samaritan that probably did this. See, the Jewish people, they didn't like the Samaritans. They were a mixed race. They were Jews that had uh, inter- intermingled and got married with other races and were worshiping other gods, and so the Jewish people, they didn't, they didn't like the Samaritans. You've probably heard people talk about that before. So in this moment, Jesus, he says the Samaritan shows up, and the expert leans in, and he's like, what's going to happen now? He's probably going to go and just finish this guy off in the ditch. And Jesus says, but unlike the first two, the church people, the least likely savior in the story comes down from his, his, his saddle and he rushes over to the aid of this broken person in the ditch. And he, he picks him up out of his brokenness. He clothes him. He bandages his wounds. And he loads him on his own donkey. And he rushes him to an inn. He brings him to the inn and he pays for all the expenses. Talk about self-sacrificial love. He pays for all of his expenses. And then he tells him this. Listen, whatever debt is accrued here, Whatever expense that you have, I'm going away, but I will return in any expense that you've paid to make sure that this person, they become healed and whole. Any expense, I'm going to reimburse you. I'm going to pay you back. What a picture of Jesus. The end is the church, right? Jesus says, church, if you will not, if you will not be afraid to, to, to have expenditures that may cost you deeply by bearing someone else's burdens, whatever expense you, you take for helping people and loving your city, whatever you give, you sell your business, you tithe on your business, whatever it is, you sacrifice, you sell a car to give to someone else, anything that you do in my name to serve people, to take care of the people that I've brought to your doorstep, he says, I am going away, but I will return and I will repay you. This is what Jesus says to his church. But I love this because this shows us the magnitude of the love that God calls us to. Because the issue here is that 
Jesus is showing this guy that you have, you have a problem in your heart. Your problem is, is, is not that you don't love me. Like you love God. You love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Your problem is, is you have a limited love when it comes to your neighbors. See, Leviticus chapter 19, read it when you get a chance. It defines for the Jewish people who their neighbors were. It was their fellow Israelites. It was those that believed like them, those that had the same theology as themselves, those of the same race, the same color, the same, they dressed the same. It was, it was, it was their own. They didn't love the other people in this particular part of, of the narrative. And Jesus says, this is the issue I want to work into your heart because there is a gospel that makes you draw your circles a lot bigger than what they are. Let me ask you this question. Do you, do you, love, do you love the Democrats? <laughs> do you love the Republicans? Do you love the people with a different socioeconomic status than you? Because gospel neighboring is when we love everyone, regardless if they believe what we believe, behave how we behave, vote how we vote. This is the scope of the love that he is calling us to. It's the magnitude of this. It's, it's, a, it's a radical redefining of our neighbor. And the reality is, is that a lot of times, you know what's hard for us to love our neighbor sometimes? Because we, we've created distance between us and them. We've distanced ourselves. It's easy it's easy to, to distance yourself from a homeless person. And what happens when you do that is you begin to, with the gap, you begin to fill the gap with your own assumptions about why they are the way they are. Or you see the young lady that comes into church and she dresses a certain way, a little provocative, a little too provocative maybe for your liking. And it's easy to sit 10 rows away and to judge her because of the way she dresses because... And, you, and we can fill the gap with our assumptions and come to conclusions. And I think one of the best things that you and I can do is actually just leave this side and go to the other side and lean into their story. I wonder what his story is. I wonder what her story is. It's one of the best practices I think that you could have when you first feel any sense of judgment in your heart or prejudice in your heart towards anyone for whatever reason. One of the best things you can do first is just to say, Lord, I wonder what her story is. I wonder what his story is. Closing that distance, because distance, watch, distance creates distortion. The, the, the farther you are from someone and their brokenness and their pain, it's easy to assume why they are. It's probably because they never got an education. It's probably because they came from a broken home. It's so easy. <laughs> Distance creates distortion. One of the best things that we can do is, is things like, I love my city. Here's why. Because it's proximity that gives you perspective to the pain of the people that live in your neighborhood. It's so imperative that you and I, we, we, we don't just come to church and, and tithe and and, and do our cute quiet times and live nice, moral, buttoned up lives. Like that's important. Let's do that. Yes. But don't live our Christian lives where we just, we, we just hang out with our kind and we come together in a holy huddle, but yet that we go out into the places and the spaces where there are broken people and hurting people that are down in the ditch of life. Now, here's the thing you need to understand is that this guy, these, these guys, every, all three of them, the, the priests, the Levite, the Samaritan, all of them, they're going on a road that they always go on. This is a path that they always take. This is their road. And they come across someone on their road that is broken. See, here's what you need to understand, is that there are people that are broken and hurting on your road. It's not just over in that neighborhood. It's in your neighborhood. It's at your workplace. That there are people on your road, and if it's your road, it's your responsibility. We have a saying at our church, we say, if it's my city, it's my responsibility. We have people all over our region, like, it's so funny the way that San Francisco works. It's probably like this with Boston, too. <clears throat> people that live in San Francisco, they wear it like a badge of honor. Like, I, I, I live in San Francisco. People that don't live in San Francisco, they're like an hour away, they still claim San Francisco like they live in San Francisco. They do that in Boston. You guys don't do that here, though. Y'all proud. This is your city. But you know those people, they live like, Two hours away from Boston, like, I'm from Boston. 
No, you're not. You ain't from Boston. There's that little country town over there. You try, stop trying to act cool. <clears throat> but listen, if it's your city, we say this at our church. If it's my city, it's my responsibility. It's funny, in San Francisco, people that claim, claim San Francisco as their city, they don't actually claim responsibility for the brokenness of the city. They own the beauty, but they disown the brokenness. And what I've discovered is that God has called his church to own both, to, to evoke her beauty, the city that God's called you to, to evoke the beauty of your city, but to bridge the gap between the brokenness and the beauty so that the broken can become beautiful. This is the redemptive work of God. This is what God does. This is the, the gospel at its best, working in and through our lives in a real practical way. You see, when we begin to meet, when we begin to meet physical needs in our city, oh, here's what happens. When we meet physical needs, it opens spiritual doors. And we get into our cities, and we get into our neighborhoods, we begin to love our neighbor as ourselves. I'm telling you, it does something so, so beautiful.